Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're covering my pick for the best paladin build in Baldur's Gate 3. This is an update video to my previous video of the same name, because that video was recorded many months ago, long before Honor Mode was released, so I wanted to update it to bring the character both into the modern era of Baldur's Gate, including Honor Mode uh, potential, as well as incorporate the many lessons that we've learned from character optimization over the last many months of gameplay. I'll be focusing today on a monoclast paladin, the most popular build in the entire game, uh, so if you are looking to build a paladin, you are in good company. Um, but of course paladin has many powerful multi-class options as well, and if you're interested in those, you can check out one of the many, many build guides that I've done for paladin multi-classes. Alright, let's get to it! So what do paladins bring to the table? Well, there are many things that paladins bring, but the primary answer is damage. Paladins by default have the highest damage attacks of any character in the game, and in particular the highest burst damage of any character in the game. Paladins, with their ability to turn their spell slots into smite attacks and then multiply that damage through critical hits or other ways of increasing their damage, are the fastest class by default at bringing enemies from full hit points to zero hit points. This is very important in Dungeons & Dragons combat because an enemy at zero hit points cannot do anything. An enemy can't hurt you if they're dead, and paladins are the best class at uh, taking out important enemies from the fight, as well as providing a number of defensive and utility options to your party. In this way, they can keep the entire party safe, both by giving you defensive options and by destroying high-priority targets as quickly as possible. Paladins, therefore, have some of the highest raw power levels of any class in the entire game. They excel both at offense and defense, but they do pay for this power level in some ways. Paladins have a relatively restricted build path, needing a lot of attributes and a fairly um, set way of leveling up in order to effectively unlock the amount of sheer power that they bring to the table. And so I think that a paladin build guide is maybe more useful than any other build guide for any other class, because paladins benefit more from being built optimally than any other class in the entire game. For race for your paladin, it mostly doesn't matter what race you pick. Paladin is an incredibly um, self-sufficient class in that sense, because you get all of the weapon and armor proficiencies, as well as all of the skills that you would need just from the, the class itself. However, there are some that do have some synergy with Paladin's kit. In particular, what Paladins struggle with is mobility, so anything that increases that can be very good for your Paladin. Wood Elf gets an additional, or Half Wood Elf gets an additional 5 feet of movement speed, which is very good for getting into position, making sure you're attacking the most important enemy in a combat, and Githyanki gets Misty Step once per day, which will allow you to, as a bonus action, get next to the whatever the most threatening enemy is, and then destroy them. Githyanki also get access to the unique effects of several of the best two-handed weapons in the game, so that's another uh, point in favor of them. Also, special mention for Gnome, who gets advantage on all of their mental saving throws. Paladins get saving throw bonuses, um, and so it combined with advantage, that can make it basically impossible for you to fail saving throws against uh, most of the more dangerous effects in the game, so all of those will be uh, particularly helpful, but uh, honestly it does not matter what you select, and you can pick it mostly based on flavor, because Paladin gets almost everything that they want just from the class itself. Next comes the complicated part, ability scores. Paladin ability scores are under a tremendous amount of demand, because Paladins are what is called multi-attribute dependent, or MAD. Compared to a single attribute dependent character, paladins need higher scores in more ability scores than any other character in the game. Paladins want five of the six ability scores and want three of those to be as high as possible. A single attribute dependent character like a ranger or a rogue usually only cares about three scores at all and only wants one of them to be as high as possible, so you can see that paladins just need more stat points than other characters in order to get their ability scores as high as they like. Uh, like I always say, it's bad to be mad, but it's rad to be sad. The paladins 
uh, therefore need to carefully distribute their ability points in order to get the numbers in every score that we need, because we want strength for our weapon, we want dexterity for our initiative, we want constitution for our hit points and concentration saves, we want wisdom because it's an important saving throw, and we want charisma for our dialogue skills, as well as abilities that we're going to get later on down the line. So are the demands of needing all five of those ability scores do constrain how we can build our character. There are three ways we can go about doing this. We can either use the attribute points, uh, use the attribute items that Baldur's Gate provides. Um, so you can buy items that will allow you to replace taking points in actual stats. In particular, the elixirs of hill giant strength. You can drink one every day to set your strength to 21, and that will replace having to take strength, uh, having to actually invest points into strength. The gloves of dexterity which you find near the end of Act 1, can replace having to put points into dexterity. A second way we could do this is to forego strength altogether and use only finesse weapons. This will allow us to attack using our dexterity instead of our strength if we use daggers or short swords as our main weapon, but it does give up access to some of the best two-handed weapons in the game, which we want as a paladin. The third way is to carefully balance our ability points, and that's what I'm going to be showing you today, but I will show you attribute spreads for both of the ways to, to build if you are going to be using attribute items. To make our character function, we are going to take 16 strength to make sure that we have strength to actually hit things, uh, and 14 constitution. Normally I like to get 16 constitution, but we can sacrifice one hit point per level on this character because paladins get good hit points regardless, they have um, excellent base hit points. So while we are a little bit squishier doing it this way than a fighter or a uh, Barbarian would be with their 16 constitution. That doesn't matter because we still just kill enemies very quickly. Then we're actually going to drop wisdom all the way to 8 and put our remaining points into dexterity so that we get 14 dexterity. This will leave you with one odd point which you can put anywhere, although if the odd point bothers you, you can also uh, swap things around and do do this just to get rid of the odd point entirely so that it vanishes. Either way is fine. The nine won't won't particularly matter, but some people just don't like seeing odd points on their on their uh, character sheet. Now, you might be wondering why we're investing so much into dexterity. Paladins, of course, are a heavy armor class, meaning that they will uh, not be gaining any armor class benefit from their dexterity. And the answer is that initiative in Baldur's Gate 3 is just that important. Your dexterity contributes to your initiative rolls. And remember that I said paladins have the highest burst damage in the game. If a paladin takes their turn, nothing will take their turn after the paladin's turn because they will simply have been destroyed. So a paladin going first is critically important because then your enemies don't get a turn at all. If you are going to be using attribu uh, uh, attribute items, in particular the Elixirs of Strength, that lets you take even more dexterity, drop your strength to 8, and then you can get uh, 16 Constitution as well as 12 Wisdom. So you get a cleaner attribute spread if you are using Elixirs. Um, it's not required, but it will make the... or, or uh, you would also use this attribute spread if you're building a dexterity-based Paladin. It's not required, but it does make the attribute selection a little bit smoother. For our skills, the only important thing to make certain of is that we get athletics as well as persuasion. Persuasion is the most important dialogue skill, and it's very likely that your paladin is going to be your party face because they're a charisma-based character. If, of course, you aren't uh, the party face uh, or aren't the main character, you can forego persuasion on this character and take um, anything else that you want. But Paladins get good access to dialogue skills, so you might as well grab those. And then Athletics give you the ability to shove enemies and reposition them. Paladins often won't have a, an amazing default action for their bonus action, so the ability to shove enemies with your Athletics can really help if, enemies, if you want to push them off cliffs or into hazardous terrain or into spell effects set up by your allies. All of those can add a lot of optionality to your party. Next, we have to make the most important decision that we're going to make as a paladin, and that's which subclass to be. 
Paladins get access to three subclasses, but also get access to a fourth secret subclass, the Oathbreaker Paladin, if you break your oath. Of the three subclasses that you can select from the beginning, and also of the Oathbreaker Paladin, I think that the best one for a monoclass paladin, if you want to do the most damage, is the Oath of Vengeance. Oath of Vengeance gives you access right away to a great ability in Inquisitor's Might, and also gives you access to some of the best spell progression of any of the paladins, and one of the more powerful paladins paladin abilities as you level up, so it's my pick for the, the best offensive version of the paladin. It also has the advantage that the oath is a little bit easier to keep than the other two oaths, so you won't as often accidentally break your oath and have to spend a bunch of money buying it back from the Oathbreaker Knight, which is a downside to some of the paladins that gets especially severe in honor mode when you can't just reload a save after a dialogue choice turns out to break your oath. Paladins, uh, Oath of Vengeance Paladins right away get Inquisitor's Might, which as a bonus action makes your attacks for two turns deal extra damage equal to your Charisma, which we've boosted a little bit at character creation, so that's pretty nice, as well as Day's Enemies, which is a pretty good ability to start off with and will increase your damage output significantly in the early game. Um... Other than that, Paladins at level 1 also get Lay on Hands, which is an ability that's somewhat easy to forget, but very powerful. This, uh, for healing at this level is not very much, but every point you put into, every level you put into Paladin as a class, this healing increases by 4. And so in the late game, this can be a quite significant burst of healing and can completely undo a round of attacks or a spell from an enemy. Um, sometimes that can be worth the cost of an action, so don't forget that this uh, ability exists. And also don't forget that this ability exists. Divine Sense giving you two turns of advantage on your attack rolls against certain kinds of enemies. Again, very easy to forget to use this, but very, very powerful, because advantage is incredibly useful for paladins. Paladins do so much damage that all they care about is hitting their attacks, so any sources of advantage are good for them. And paladins benefit from critical hits more than any other character, because a critical hit doubles not only the damage dice of your weapon, but the damage dice of your smites. So if you get advantage, you critically hit twice as often. Incredible for paladins. All of these together are abilities that will power up your character a lot, so I want to make special mention of them because I think that they are easy to forget to use during actual play. All right, that is level one. No other decisions to make at this point, so let's go on to level two. At Paladin level 2, we get access to spells, a fighting style, and smite attacks. Paladins have one of the best second levels of any character in the game because we get so many things, all of which are incredibly strong. First up, let's take a look at our fighting style. We want great weapon fighting. Defense is also a good choice for Paladins, because increasing your armor class is great, but great weapon fighting just increases your damage output significantly. The great weapon fighting reroll on a 1 or a 2 does work with your smite damage as well, so it's going to make your damage significantly higher and significantly more consistent, uh, and this is why we particularly want to be invested into strength to be using a two-handed weapon, is so we get access to this and the two-handed weapons that roll lots of damage dice to increase our damage as much as possible. For our spell selection, it's important to know that you won't usually be casting any of these spells. Most of the time, your spells are going to be used for smite attacks, um, because every paladin spell slot represents 2d8 damage when you spend it on a, on a smite. And at this stage in the game, that's enough to kill basically any enemy if you do a smite, especially if you combine it with Inquisitor's Might uh, and just a two-handed weapon. You're going to be bringing almost any enemy down from full health to zero. So every time you cast a spell, you're giving up one use of, of that very powerful ability. However, we can still get quite a bit of benefit out of having the right spells equipped. Firstly, we're going to grab Bless, because Bless is very powerful, and for difficult fights, it can be worth it to concentrate on Bless, just to make sure you hit more often. Um, typically, you'd prefer to have this cast from a Cleric, but it's still very good to have it available on your Paladin. Second, we're going to take Thunderous Smite. Not only is this a powerful ability in and of itself, 2d6 damage is almost as good as the 2d8 damage that the the Divine Smite does, and sometimes pushing an enemy 10 feet and knocking it prone is better than doing an extra uh, 2 average damage with the attack. You can also use Thunderous Smite and a Normal Smite in the same attack for even higher burst damage. It costs you 2 spell slots, but that will increase your damage output significantly. 
For our remaining two spells, it's less clear. Uh, it's less important what we pick. Those two are the the most important ones. But some situational spells that you could get a lot of value uh, out of are very useful. Things like um, protection from good and evil are very good in certain encounters. So you can prepare that just to use it for an encounter where it's good. Uh, I recommend that over preparing spells that you would want to cast more regularly. Command is normally an amazing spell, but with only 14 charisma, we won't succeed as often. And if you want an enemy to not act, you're better off just killing them than trying to control them with a paladin. And then we can also benefit from Shield of Faith. Um, this is one that I wouldn't recommend usually casting, but in the later game can give us plus two armor class for the entire day at the cost of only a, a level one spell slot. And especially if you long rest fairly frequently, this can be a valuable addition to your paladin. But for the most part, you're using all of your spell slots for smites. Other than that, nothing else that we're doing at level two. So let's go to level three. And at paladin level three, we get access to... Uh, Increased power from our selected Oath, so we get both additional spell access, Hunter's Mark and Bane, available from our Oath spells. Neither of these are incredibly useful for this character, though if you know a fight is going to go extremely long, Hunter's Mark can increase your damage output more than a level 1 smite would have. Um, Basically, the more attacks you make against an enemy, the more damage Hunter's Mark does. So if you are going into a very long fight, you can gain extra damage out of Hunter's Mark. For the most part, though, these are not going to be significantly uh, impacting your strategies. But the big thing that you get from level 3 Paladin at, with Oath of Vengeance is Vow of Enmity. Now, Vow of Enmity as a bonus action for a channel Oath charge lets you gain advantage on attack rolls against an enemy. So you can bonus action cast it on an enemy and have advantage on attack rolls against that enemy until they die. That's very, very powerful because Paladin loves advantage, but also, at time of recording, Vow of Enmity is bugged, and you can cast it on yourself and gain advantage just on all of your attacks for the entire duration of the 10 turns. Now, this is a bug and might be fixed at some point, but it's been in the game basically forever and has never been addressed, so I don't know if it will actually ever be fixed. Um, I will say that even if you feel bad using this, because it, it, it is abusing a bug, um, the normal use of Vow of Enmity, of just casting it on the most powerful enemy in the combat, is still extremely strong, but you can power it up even further by self-casting Vow of Enmity and attacking everything with advantage. It's also somewhat flavorful that you get to declare that you are your own worst enemy and then lash out at everyone around you. I think that's just very funny. Um, so the Vow of Enmity increases your damage output as well as your hit chance significantly. Paladins just care about hitting their attacks, and Vow of Enmity lets you do that extremely regularly in important combats, so it's the reason to go Oath of Vengeance is this ability being so strong. We also get Abjure Enemy, which I wouldn't recommend using typically because this uses a Charisma saving throw, and our, our saving throws are just not going to be as high as... Um, uh, as you would like. Although slowing an enemy is still very powerful, um, so for long combat where you know that you are going to be letting the enemy have several turns, it can still be very useful. A slowed enemy is much less harmful um, than one that isn't, of course. So if you know that the combat's going to go at least three turns and the enemy's going to get to act at least three times, this can be worth a channel oath charge, but typically you, you would prefer to spend the channel oath charge just on Vow of Enmity. You also get uh, immunity to disease, which comes up a couple times throughout the game, but is a relatively minor benefit. At level four, we get access to our first feat, and the feat that we are going to take is Alert. Alert gives you a plus five bonus to initiative, which basically guarantees that you go first in every combat. And if you go first as a paladin, enemies usually won't get to go second. So alert gives you so much combat effectiveness because you can kill enemies be before they ever get a chance to go. And then you never have to find out what horrible thing they were planning to do on their turn because they are dead. Uh, alert will increase your effectiveness in combat more than any of the other options. But if you feel like you really don't need it, maybe you're using 
elixirs of vigilance every day. There are other options for feats. You can take an ability improvement to increase your strength to 18. Um, you could take great weapon master to increase your damage, although you'll definitely want to pair this with bless or other ways to make sure that you are actually landing your attacks. Or you can take savage attacker, which is going to increase your average smite damage significantly because it lets you reroll the damage dice for smites. Um, but overall, you're going to get more effectiveness out of alert than any of these options at this stage, especially for honor mode. Going first is incredibly important. That's why we invested heavily into decks from the beginning. And with a plus seven bonus or even just a plus five bonus, we will get to go first in almost every combat in the game. Combined with some initiative boosting gear, alert will allow us to go first. This also, because we took alert, lets us now respec to remove some of this dexterity. We can drop our dexterity down to 10 or so um, and put those extra points into constitution or charisma, which will fix some of our multi-attribute dependency. In the early stages, we really needed this to go first, but alert can sort of replace that and let us bring those points back into our build elsewhere, um, increasing our effectiveness even more. By this point, we will probably have found good heavy armor, so we won't need the dexterity points for armor class anyways. In the early game, you're probably wearing medium armor and need the 14 dex for armor class as well, but by level 4, you probably have a decent set of heavy armor, and combined with alert, that lets you uh, skimp on dexterity and still gain all of the benefits of it. So overall, highly recommend taking alert, especially for honor mode runs. Going first is just that good. At uh, character level 5, we get access to two things that increase our power significantly. The first is extra attack, which gives us just twice as many attacks in a turn, which obviously is amazing in and of itself, but also lets us use twice as many smite attacks in a turn, increasing our burst damage enormously. We can now use up to three smites in a turn because we can use one of the bonus action smites in addition to a normal smite um, to use thunderous smite plus two high level smites to do a tremendous amount of burst damage. We also get access to second level spells, which mostly is a damage boost for our smites. The second level spell slots do more damage when spent on smite attacks, um, but also gives us access to some cool utility spells at this level. The most important of these isn't one we actually learn from being a paladin, but one we learn from being a vengeance paladin specifically, and that's Misty Step. Misty Step uh, single-handedly solves all of your positioning issues as a character and is critically important for every character in Baldur's Gate to get access to. It'll let you get on top of the most dangerous enemy in an encounter, no questions asked, or run away if an encounter is going badly. Uh, very important spell and great that we get access to it from our Paladin Oath. And then we also get access to the other level 2 spells. Now there aren't any here that we particularly need, and we're almost always going to use these spells for smites rather than actually casting. So let's just go ahead and prepare ones that are very situational, situational but nice to have when they do come up. Things like protection from poison uh, and lesser restoration are good emergency buttons. And then we can honestly pick whatever we want as our last spell. You are almost never going to cast any of these other spells. Um, because they don't solve a problem that you have. Uh, so you can pick up command or something like that, and maybe uh, if you've increased your charisma, sometimes you can command enemies, especially uh, if you can't reach melee. But in general, you are going to be using all of your spell slots for smite at this point, so what spells you prepare won't matter tremendously. All right, character level 6. We get to increase our party's defensive defenses massively. We get Aura of Protection, which gives you and any nearby allies a plus zero bonus to saving throws. This plus zero is just a bugged tooltip. Uh, the actual bonus to saving throws is equal to your charisma. So if you've increased your charisma to 16 at this point or boosted it in any other way, a plus three bonus to saving throws is huge. This is why we could get away with taking low wisdom, because we have uh, wisdom save proficiency and we're getting wisdom saves from our aura. So even though wisdom is a very important saving throw to have, paladins can increase it just by increasing their charisma with aura of protection, and then can also save their entire party from debilitating saving throw targeting effects. Uh, anything that targets your, your saves is usually quite dangerous to you, so increasing those is very good and one of the great things about paladins. It is a relatively small aura, it's only 10 feet, and also you have to remember to activate it after you level up. It's not on by default, but once you activate it, it stays on forever. Um, but this will make your party significantly more survivable over the course of the game. 
At Paladin level 7, you get the Relentless Avenger class feature from Oath of Vengeance, which honestly is not a significant boost to the character. It's a nice to have if you do hit an enemy with an opportunity attack, but not something that is going to significantly change how the character plays out. Um, so you will use it when it comes up, but don't don't worry about trying to trigger this or anything. Make opportunity attacks because you want to do damage, not because you want to trigger this ability. You also just get more spell slots, and more spell slots is more smite attacks, which of course is excellent for paladins. At paladin level 8, we get our second feat, and uh, for this level, we're just going to take an ability improvement to increase our strength. At this point, we really want to be making sure that we're landing our attacks as often as possible, so increasing our strength just makes our hit chance better. Um, and we will also be investing pretty heavily in items that increase our hit chance, and of course we get advantage on our attacks very frequently. So the ability to increase our strength um, to make sure that we're landing attacks is just very important. If you are going with the Strength Elixir build, and therefore do not need to put any points into Strength, then at this level you'll just take Savage Attacker to increase your damage as much as possible. That's the, the feat that's going to be most useful for you there. But for the normal build without Strength Elixirs, you just want to boost your Strength at this stage. At Paladin level 9, we get access to 3rd level spells, which increases your smite damage even more, um, and also gives you access to a number of very powerful abilities. Firstly, you get as your oath spell, Haste, and Haste is very good for Paladins. Self-casting Haste is somewhat dangerous, because if you uh, lose concentration on it, you get stunned and lose your next turn, so that's always a little bit frightening. But for a, a Paladin specifically, self-casting Haste is much less dangerous because you have a bonus to your concentration saves from your Paladin Aura. That saving throw boost does work on concentration saves and makes you much, much less likely to fail concentration saves on Haste. Now, you usually won't do this every fight. You're better off getting Haste from an ally or from a, a speed potion or something like that, but it's a nice option to have. And protection from energy is also a nice option to have if you're going into a fight where a specific elemental type comes up most often. Again, as always, Paladin spells are used for smites, so don't cast these spells as by default, but remember that they're there, because sometimes they are worth casting. For our prepared spells at this level, we also get to add a couple third level spells in, and there are some third level spells that are situationally quite powerful. Daylight can just win certain encounters on its own, uh, especially in the late game, so having access to that is quite good. Uh, Warden of Vitality is actually very good for long fights. Restore Vitality is a very powerful healing ability, uh, and so while normally this is useful more for like multi-class builds with Life Cleric and Bard, this is still a, a spell that can come up occasionally. And Elemental Weapon actually increases your weapon damage significantly. Normally you'll get this from an item rather than actually casting it, but as a day-long buff, uh, Elemental Weapon will increase your damage output over the course of a long rest uh, quite a lot, and especially if you have ways to regain that spell slot, um, you can cast it and then benefit from your weapon being buffed uh, quite a lot, plus one to hit and uh, and an additional 1d4 damage is a pretty significant boost to your damage output. Um, you can benefit from that, refresh the spell slot, and then still use it for smites, so elemental uh, weapon is very good as well. The other uh, paladin abilities at this uh, point are not significant, or other paladin spells you get at this point are not significant. Remove curse can come up in some situations, so maybe you want to prepare that, uh, although of course remember you can always change your prepared spells out of combat to be able to swap in one of these situational spells. Um, generally, if you want Remove Curse, you'd prefer to get it from a Cleric ally, because you won't be casting it in combat. Uh, but your Paladin can do it in a pinch. At Paladin level 10, you have another aura that you have to remember to turn on, and Immunity to Frightened is actually very good. Um, there are some late game fights where fear immunity is very important, and usually you'll get this by casting Hero's Feast on your party, but that costs a 6th level spell slot, so getting this just for free from an aura is very good. Nothing else significant at this level though, so let's go on to level 11, and the entire reason to stay monoclass Paladin for this long shows up at this level. 
At level 11, you get Improved Divine Smite, which makes all of your attacks do an extra 1d8 radiant damage. This is basically like getting a level 0 smite on every attack, and also like increasing the, the smite level of all of your actual smites by 1. Normally you would want on Paladin to, to try to get 4th level spell slots to get even more smite damage, but Improved Divine Smite that you get just boosts your damage naturally. So even on turns where you don't have smites, don't have spell slots to smite with, your damage is really good and scales with the number of attacks that you're making in a round and also all the rerolls that you're going to be getting uh, from Great Weapon Master and so on. Um, but also, this makes your actual smite damage significantly higher as, as well, when uh, actual uh, burst damage significantly higher as well when you do decide to spend. Uh, resources on smiting. So this uh, looks like a relatively innocuous boost, but is actually a significant boost to your character's damage output, um, and makes getting Paladin 11 worth it because it just increases your damage uh, so much. You also get one more level 3 spell slot, which is more level 3 smites, which is of course excellent. Finally, at character level 12, we get access to our our third and final feat, and here we have a choice really between getting an ability improvement into strength or taking Savage Attacker, and I'm going to recommend taking Savage Attacker. By this point in the game, we have probably collected enough bonuses to our hit chance that Savage Attacker will increase our damage more than uh, improving our hit chance. 18 strength plus the, the bonuses that you're able to acquire throughout the game will be enough. Um, and so Savage Attacker just allowing you to reroll smite damage significantly improves your damage output at this stage. Not only does it improve your average damage output, it also makes your damage much more reliable. The enemy of optimization is randomness, so the ability to tighten the distribution of damage that you're doing by, by re-rolling means it's much more predictable how much damage you're going to do, which lets you plan your turns significantly better. If you've been going for the Strength Elixir build, and therefore already have Savage Attacker, then at this point you can grab Great Weapon Master. All the same things apply, um, where you will probably have enough hit, uh, hit bonuses at this point in the game that you're landing your attacks very reliably regardless, so Great Weapon Master can just increase your damage output even more. All right, that is our Paladin build, but of course we can power it up even further with items, and I will talk briefly about multiclassing as well, so let's do that. For items for this character, there's really four different things that we care about. We're looking to increase our hit chance as much as possible, because Paladins just need to land their attacks in order to function, so anything that increases our hit chance is very important. We're also looking for increases to our critical hit chance, and especially for guaranteed criticals, because that can let you, uh, with 100% certainty, get a critical against an important enemy so that you can take them out as quickly as you can. Uh, next, we are looking for increases to initiative, because alert is very good, but not enough to guarantee winning initiative on its own, so increasing our initiative further is very important and can let us guarantee winning initiative and killing enemies before they go. And finally, we're looking for defensive items that can help keep this character alive. Our defenses are relatively low for a melee build, so anything that increases our armor class or hit points is a nice bonus after we've fulfilled the first three. Uh, conditions. Anything that increases your hit chance is good, so in particular keep an eye out for weapon coatings like the Oil of Accuracy and the Diluted Oil of Sharpness, or items that just have plus one to attack rolls on them. Uh, Gloves of Dexterity give you plus one attack, for example, um, just because that will make you much more likely to actually land your attacks. Next, you want increases to your critical hit chance, and also anything that provides a guaranteed critical. Things like the Killer's Sweetheart can give you guaranteed critical smites, and doubling your smite damage means that an enemy dies significantly faster. Anything uh, that gives you a um, reduces the roll you need to critical hit, like the Knife of the Undermountain King, though typically you won't be able to actually equip this one, but anything with this line of text on it, where you reduce the number you need to roll a critical hit, is very important to this character as well. Um, and then anything that increases your initiative. You're also looking for a good two-handed weapon that rolls multiple damage dice, because you will be able to re-roll those damage dice both with Savage Attacker and with Great Weapon Master. So you're looking for a great sword or Warhammer in particular that have multiple damage 
damage dice as their base uh, damage and also add additional damage dice when you attack. The Soulbreaker Greatsword fills a lot of those roles, especially if you're a Githyanki, because it gives you multiple damage dice and an initiative bonus. Um, and then, so th that, and then if you're a Githyanki, it gives you an additional damage that you can then reroll again as well. Um, and in the uh, early game, another very good item is the Unseen Menace, uh, which just gives you advantage on every attack, which means you're going to critically hit more often. So those are the two early game weapons that I would recommend. And then in the late game, you're just looking for whatever the most powerful two-handed weapon you have is. Basically, just look at this damage number. You just want to increase that as much as possible. For attribute items, there are a few different directions that you can go. Of course, if you're going for the Elixir's build, you want the Elixir of Hill Giant Strength. And then also an incredibly powerful item for this character is the Gloves of Dexterity. If you respec to drop your Dexterity to 8, that gives you the, the attribute points back to spend elsewhere and fix your attributes. And then you can equip the Gloves of Dexterity, set your Dexterity to 18, and that also lets you wear medium armor. If you find one of the medium armors that doesn't uh, cap your armor class, that can actually be better armor class than heavy armor, while also giving you advantages like plus one initiative from the Yuan-Ti scale mail. Uh, so altogether, those are very good. Another uh, good item to increase your hit chance is an Elixir of Heroism. This gives you a permanent bless that stacks with normal sources of bless. So if you're not using strength elixirs, this is probably the best elixir for the character, although viciousness or bloodlust are obviously very good as well. Um, and then one other option for this character is to equip uh, just the best heavy armor that you can find, in which case you're just looking for the highest uh, armor class number. Just look for the, the biggest number for armor class just to make sure that you don't get hit as often. So to sum up, the highest armor class, especially if you're not using the Gloves of Dexterity, any chance to any increase to your initiative, any increase to your chance to hit, and any increase to your critical hit chance, those are the items that you're looking for throughout the game. Finally, to briefly touch on multi-classing, although I mentioned I'm focusing on a mono-class paladin here. The important thing about paladin is that they actually can mix and match multi-classes with just about any class extremely well. Uh, as long as you hit level 2 or level 5 paladin to get your spell slots and smite attacks, as well as extra attack if you're not getting it from whatever your multi-class is, you're going to end up with an excellent character, especially if you're mixing and matching with one of the other charisma classes. Sorcerer can give you the defensive options uh, from the shield spell, which will keep you alive significantly longer, and help you hit higher level spell slots. Check out my sorcerer and guide for more on that. Warlock can give you Warlock spell slots, which refresh on a short rest, so that can let you use high-level smite many more times per day. Check out my Lockedin guide for that. And Bard uh, can give you access to the Swords Bard Flourishes, which will let you sweep, uh, attack multiple enemies, and smite multiple enemies in a turn much more easily, um, as well as accessing higher level spell slots if you invest many levels into Bard. Two levels of Fighter can give you Action Surge, which will just let you do your whole Paladin burst damage thing t uh, twice as many times in a turn, which is of course excellent. So all of those are great options for Paladin uh, multi-classes. Typically, Paladins won't want to dip one level of other classes, uh, but instead will be used more as more in-depth multi-classes. So definitely check out my guides to uh, all of those combinations if you're interested in more uh, in-depth looks at the multi-classing. All right, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this video. And as always, if you have, feel free to leave a comment and like the video. Uh, both of those things help me out a ton with the algorithm. And you can subscribe to my channel for more Baldur's Gate 3 build guides and other strategy game content. Cheers, my friends. I'll catch you next time.